Welcome to another episode of our personal empowerment audio program, Finding Yourself in Paradise. Hi, I'm Michael Benner. And I'm Steve Snyder. And our program today is entitled, Failing to Succeed. Now, of course, that has at least a couple of meanings. The idea of being unsuccessful at success, or the idea of using failure as a means to create success. And I think more than the double entendre, I think we'll find many more entendres as we go through the show. Yeah, there's all kinds of uh, definitions of success, and I think we need to address some at the beginning. One is just the dynamic nature of success, that if we see it as a destination, then we're going to have to continue to redefine it, because as soon as you attain some level of success, if you stayed there and didn't move forward or continue to grow or evolve or get better in some way, how successful would that be? So what if we talk about success in the best of terms as a dynamic, a continual unfolding or development of a process that just keeps getting better and better? Yeah, if success is some destination that you're not there yet and, oh, now I'm there, then it's done. That's one way of looking at it, and I think that's the way most people look at success as something to attain. But if that's the definition of success for you, then it's a momentary experience, and then you're not successful anymore because the next thing you have to do is figure out what do you want to do next, and then you got to head toward that. So you get success as this brief instant of time, and then another brief instant of time later on. That's not what success really is about. Successful people understand that success is what you experience on the way in the process of achieving your goals, in the process of moving toward getting what you want, and that success is not defined by getting what you want. Success is defined find by the experience of moving toward getting what you want. And that addresses the title, the whole idea of failing to succeed, of failing forward, of learning from our mistakes. I think this is one of the challenges to schools, especially now since it's been ignored for so long. Be sure you're teaching the children that mistakes are an opportunity to learn. They're not just a bad thing that lowers your grade, but they're symptomatic of what is yet to be understood by the student. So pay attention to what you failed at rather than just getting credit for the answers you already knew. Here's the stuff that you need to learn before we move on. Yeah, it's so silly when you think about it. The way the school system is set up is that they teach you the stuff and then you prove what you do know and what you don't know. And then from what you don't know, the ones you got wrong on the test, you get to feel bad about that. You get to feel like a failure. And then they move on to the next lesson without ever addressing the fact that, hey, you didn't get this other stuff. You proved you didn't get this other stuff. You know, the way to do it would be, and I've dreamed of this all my life, is you get to take the test as many times as it takes until you get them all right. And then you move on to the next lesson. That's the whole idea, isn't it? Learning the stuff. The whole idea is, not let's see if I can prove that I don't know it. That's not the idea. But the school system's designed so that as soon as you've proved you don't know it, they have to move forward into something else you don't know. And I think there's tragedy in here because a young student is often going to assume that because they've performed poorly in school, even if only in this area or that area, they tend to take it on as an identity. This is not just something I did. This is who I am. That erodes whatever healthy self-image they have now, minimizes the chances they'll develop self-esteem, and they become the poor student. I mean, did you have in grade school those three levels of reading groups? Like We had red, green, and blue. What did, did you have? I was thinking <laughs> pink and yellow and yeah, something. Right. I don't know, but... They could call them one, two, three, or whatever. We, we, kn we knew it was the smart ones, the okay yeah. ones, and the stupid ones. It was pretty know? clear to yeah. the kids within a matter of days who's who. And my experience of that, growing up in a small town where there were three elementary schools but only one high school, a third of the kids I graduated with in high school I'd known since kindergarten. And sure enough, the kids that were in the yellow reading group or the poor reading group or whatever – they were not in college prep. They were taking shop classes or vocational training or whatever. And the kids that were the better readers when they were six years old were in the college prep and, and uh, getting the better grades. And you might say, as many teachers would, didn't we do a great job at identifying the poor learner? No, I think what we did was condemn the child to a self-fulfilling prophecy where the kid that's good at reading and reading out loud, as you point out, because when you're a kid, that's part of it, 
gets to be identified as a great student early on, and it has a self-fulfilling prophecy that goes along with it. They have the freedom to excel. Now, the poor student, the kid who just doesn't read well or doesn't read well out loud, is identified as a bad student. That becomes self-fulfilling, and they may live their whole lives with dreams unfulfilled because of something that happened when they were six years old. And not just self-fulfilling, but reinforced by their families because the parents hear from the teacher that this is a good kid, and now they raise their expectations for the student, and the student performs better and better and better. Or they hear from the teacher, oh, this, he's having trouble, he's not a very good reader, and then they lower their expectations of their child. See, it, as long as we have failure wired as a bad thing, we're going to hurt our children. Because they're going to get the idea that it's not okay to fail. Failure has negative ramifications and no positive ramifications. And therefore, they become too risk adverse and aren't willing to take the chances it takes to, to have the failures, to make the mistakes. We did a whole show called New Mistakes, Making New Mistakes. To make the new mistakes. Now, not to repeat your old mistakes, but to make new mistakes, to take some risks. That's what really creates the excitement of life. And a lot of the what I would define as success for me is making new mistakes, learning from them, and growing on and, and succeeding. We really need to talk at the top also about the whole victim mentality. I think most people, if pressed, would understand that parts of our lives are done to us and parts of our lives are responses to that or initiations, behavior, or speech, whatever that we initiate. But I think the emphasis for most people is on the former rather than the latter, on playing the victim or even finding some sort of payoff or advantage to being the helpless victim of life being done to me. Well, Who's going to set goals and seek success if life is done to you, if it's all a fait accompli, if providence rules and your free will doesn't matter very much? And I think there's a lot of appeal in society to helplessness, whether it's government or corporations, uh, advertisers who have a product or a service that they're promoting. It's like, well, it's not your fault. Uh, you didn't do anything. Here, you need our solution. You need us. And so it gets reinforced. And the idea that we are our choices, I think, has become sort of arcane. Camus said it. Sartre said it. Others said you are the totality of the choices you make. And what a wonderful statement. So empowering to say, I have choices. I am the I am the result of the choices I make, and I can either initiate a response or out of whole cloth, I can go out and define my successes. Yeah, or you can let society do it, as you were just saying. You know, the government, the advertisers, that's what they want to do. They want to define success for you. They want to say, you're a success if you have my product. You're a success if you believe in my philosophy. I mean, what was 1963 that Mick Jagger said, you can't be a man unless you smoke the same cigarette as me? You know, it's like they've been pushing us to define success through their eyes all our lives. You can't define success through other people's eyes. You can't, you can't do that. Success is a very personal experience, you know? Take it from somebody who feels successful. It's a very personal experience. Somebody else would look at my life and say, yeah, that's successful. Somebody else would look at my life and say, that's not successful. I don't really care. What I care about is I feel successful. And because I've defined it, I've, I've set this is what it is for me, not because what advertisers say, not because I'm supposed to be this, not because of anything but a lifelong self expression exploration and self-discovery into who I am that I've done by myself and with you and, and others along the way. And, and I know a lot about what success means for me because I've looked in the one place the answer exists, and that's inside of me. The idea of, and we've discussed this before, but it's very important, the idea of dealing with disappointment also intrigues me in this context because part of being successful is recognizing that all your dreams didn't come true. Because exactly. they couldn't all come true, because exactly. there wasn't enough time and space for all. We, you know, we sort of played it safe and had lots of dreams, didn't we? Yeah, Neil, Neil Young said, if you follow every dream, you might get lost. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There's only a certain number of them you can pursue. There you go. So I look back on my life, though I feel rather successful, and I'm very in touch with that being a dynamic unfolding that will never end. I want it to be better and better and better. You've and said better and better as long as I've known you, and that's 30 years now. That's a wonderful <laughs> affirmation. Hats off to Emil Kuwe that's for right. coining that whole phrase. Every day and every way, I'm doing better and better and better. But, uh, you know, to look back and 
see areas where my dreams did not come true. And now I'm glad they didn't come true because that would have been a cul-de-sac. That would have been a dead end. That 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 had the appearance of success at the time, but it it, it lacked the heart and soul. And I like where I went. And, and, and so, as we always say, it's a matter of ready, aim, fire, then aim, 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 aim. You have the ability to manage, to modify, to mediate, to change your mind as you approach the goal. We have to, as Stephen Covey says, begin with the end in mind. Okay, Success requires the goal setting. And then, having determined a direction more than a destination, you begin to create a strategy, a plan, uh, a moving forward. And there's success in that. Right. So the only not success or anti-success is not failure, but rather doing nothing, doing nothing, staying the same or, or letting everything else influence you and not making your own decisions, not thinking for yourself. That's the thing I would define as not success, you know, just being pushed and shoved, you know, and not not taking any control of the vehicle that is you and the movement of it forward. That to me would be the anti-success. So so the idea here is is. What, what is stopping us uh, from doing things? What causes us to do nothing? And I think you hit the nail on the head a minute ago when you said it's disappointment, you know, the fear of disappointment. People are so afraid that if they set a goal and they don't achieve it, they'll have this thing called disappointment, and that would be worse than they have now, so let's not even go for it. And so what they do is they just play victim, and they say, well, you know, the, the universe made me into what I am or whatever. But the bottom line is if you are not afraid of disappointment, if you – if you set a goal and you don't achieve it and it's okay, you know, life goes on, then you'll keep doing that. It's when you find that devastating. And I think, I've said this before, I think the only reason that I can understand that people would choose to, to cause disappointment to be so overwhelmingly huge in their lives, to be so such a block in their lives, is bad parenting. It's just parents that really push, don't get your hopes up too high, don't dream, don't, keep your feet on the ground, don't let yourself uh, think good things could happen because, you know, bad things are going to happen. And, and pessimistic parents saying to their kids, don't get your hopes up too high. We don't want you to be disappointed. That is what destroys people's uh, courage to move forward and to succeed. For me, even stronger than that, frankly, because I had plenty of that at home. But even stronger is a fear of not doing well in school. So if I made a mistake, that's a bad thing. As we're saying here today, doesn't need to be. Great teachers are women and men who have always said what we're promoting. Learn from the mistake. Look, here's the number you got wrong. Let's double down, go back, pay attention to the ones you got wrong, rather than just creating an identity out of it and moving on. You're a C student. What do you expect? I'll give up mine if you'll give up your expectations, right? But this whole idea of... Uh, learning from the mistake of of a disappointment may be a blessing in disguise. It's it's like if we have a fundamental confidence in ourself and if we seek to become better problem solvers and see ourselves as agents of problem solving, agents of change then we're going to do much better in this area than if we're trying to get comfortable. I think there's an appeal in the society that says the best thing for you to do to live your life and quality and success is get it together. Get to a point where all your ducks are in a row and you have no more problems and you'll never have another problem again. I don't think anybody's ever manage to get to a place where they have no problems. And if they did... That's a problem. It wouldn't be for... <laughs> <laughs> that would be a big problem. Well, that too. But it wouldn't be for very long before yeah. life would, yeah. you know, hand you something. Because you know, the, the people, the people that really like do get really evolved like that, they they expand, and so if there's an earthquake on another continent, it's a problem for them. So there's always going to be problems, even if you become really evolved. There's always problems, and that enriches us, That's right? So, to identify that early in life, to say, I'm going to give up this phony dream of trying to get to a place where there are no problems, getting enough money or enough knowledge or knowing the right people or status or prestige or whatever. I'm not going to get to a no-problem place. 
but I can grow. My success is in me being an ever better problem solver to learning more quickly, to being more elegant and graceful in the way I embrace a problem and comprehend that problem and respond to that problem with a solution, brainstorming with other people and using resources and so on. But as long as we see it as a dynamic unfolding process and ourselves as agents of change, always learning beings, that life is growth and learning and healing and understanding, evolving and unfolding. If I have a house plant that stops growing, I know I overwatered it, I killed another one, too much care, too much water. If it's alive, it's going to grow. Well, that's not only true for house plants, that's a universal. If you're not growing and you feel like you're dying, grow, learn. And that feeling will go away. You'll begin to feel more vital and alive. But remember to do it with happiness because yeah. that's the, the road. That's the experience. With happiness, you create the success. So you start with the core experience of happiness. Now, it doesn't matter what your circumstances are. They could be wonderful. They could be terrible. You could still be happy or unhappy. Happiness doesn't have to do with circumstances. So it's a choice. Happiness is a choice. You get to choose in any given moment to be happy. At any given moment, you could remember the nicest thing that ever happened to you. At any given moment, you could fantasize the most wonderful thing you could ever imagine. At any given moment, you could choose to be happy. So why not choose to be happy most given moments? You know, have some space for times to, you know, to be not happy. You know, it's not possible to be happy 24-7 or you wouldn't recognize it as being happy if it didn't have its antithesis. But it's a percentage thing. You know, if you live in happy most of the time. Now, how do you do that? Well, I think there's a whole lot of answers to that question. But for me, I'll give you my best shot at it. It's you pay attention to your thoughts and feelings. And you say yes and embrace the ones you like. And you take a deep breath and release it as you release the thoughts and feelings you don't like. And, and with the feeling of, I'm glad I'm getting rid of that one. I'm glad I'm releasing that. I'm glad I'm getting that out of my system. So that when I have a good thought, it makes me feel good. When I have a bad thought, it makes me feel good. When any thought that pops into my head, I, what I do is I think. You see, a lot of people don't think very much. I, I think this is true, that, that if you define thinking as doing new stuff rather than remembering things like if you're saying something you've said before or thought before that's not called thinking if you use that definition thinking is only like new stuff then most people just are mostly doing old stuff mostly they're either watching tv or doing stuff out there or they're going over old stuff in here they're not doing that much thinking but for me when a negative thought pops into my head even an old one like a worry thought or an anxiety thought or something like that i don't just let it go i think about it wait a minute why am i having that thought and oh i can let that go and when you think about your thoughts and think that you like your good thoughts and think that you don't like yeah, consciously, consciously purposefully. Right. Purposefully is a good word. You, you can be happy by purposely paying attention to your thoughts and feelings and embracing the good ones and releasing the bad ones. We've got to emphasize, we cannot overstate, I don't think, that the power of a thought is not in the thought but in your response to the thought. Same thing for feelings. Yeah. I've got... Uh, well, I've had a number of clients over the years who would, uh, in various ways, share their negative dialogue with me. And some of them would say, well, this is what my mind says, Michael, when I apply these positive thoughts and concepts and affirmations you teach. And some just argue back. They're, they don't have that second level of observation. And so they speak to me the way their mind speaks to them. And they've got an argument for every angle that I can offer, every alternative, every, you know, other way of looking at it or reframing something or a suggestion that's positive. By golly, some of them just have such well-honed arguments, right? And they don't even know that they're choosing to agree with the argument. They just pass it on to me as if it's a fact, as if, yeah, but is the first thing they say in every sentence. Yeah, but, yeah, but. And then again, as I said a moment ago, some of my clients have the level of awareness that they can share by saying, well, this is what my mind is telling me. And it tells me that a lot. And it keeps insisting, even though I try to educate it or train it or, or domesticate it, you know, take the fear out of it. 
And so that's where we get the opening to, well, are you those thoughts? Are you those feelings? Are you going to let them drive? Or are you going to put your consciousness, your awareness into the driver's seat, value all thoughts and feelings, but be the one that decides to either affirm or reject or harvest a little piece of value out of it and throw away the rest, whatever, all these options, all these possibilities, and what we do with the thought and the feeling. And I just am amazed that that is still not taught in very early grade school, that you're not just these thoughts and feelings. You are this being that could agree or disagree, that can change your mind, that can put it on the back burner and let it simmer for a while and cogitate about it, feel it out, and then decide later. I mean, you have that power. You are the choices you make. That's right. And, you know, it's real important to understand that you shouldn't believe everything you think because you think a lot of wrong things. And accepting thoughts as being facts is a stupid idea. That's if, if nothing else, school proved that. You know, you got a lot of them wrong on those tests. You thought that was right and you were wrong. So lots of thoughts are wrong. And feelings, although feelings are, are true. I mean, if I'm sad, I'm sad. I could be sad because I got a p- false piece of information that wasn't true. And, and I'm sad about something that isn't even real. So feelings, they're also quite subjective as well. So it's real important to understand that you're not an unhappy person or you're not in unhappy circumstances, you're not choosing to be happy. And in any given moment, you can choose to be happy. And if you choose to be happy, that's one of the greatest criteria for moving toward that living a successful life that we're talking about. That failing to succeed is because you're unhappy. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how great a job you or, or business you own. I don't care how wonderful your life looks on the outside. If you're unhappy, I don't think you're a success personally. And I don't think most people would disagree with me. They're linked, but let's say it again. Success will not create happiness. It's happiness that is the way to become successful. I wanted to show this to you. I don't think I've shown you this. This is a cartoon from the New Yorker. And it's a... Uh, a woman and a man, presumably husband and wife, sitting on the sofa watching their big screen TV. And read what it says in the bottom, what, what's coming out of the TV as they watch TV. It says, this week on The Amazing Race to Enlightenment, can Jim and Susie achieve right mindfulness? And will Barb and Candy be eliminated for relentless clinging to the self? <laughs> <laughs> if mindfulness is a cartoon in The New Yorker, we're making progress. There's it's starting success to... Going there. Start but now you got me wondering, is she going to make it or not? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Mindfulness is the proper word for what Steve and I are talking about, the second level of thinking that is essential to personal development. And a nice, simple, non-religious way, too many times people get this confused for religion or some arcane psychology or philosophy. It's as simple as saying, hey, I have choices. Even when it comes to agreeing or disagreeing with my inner thought and feeling processes, I have choices about what I think about my thoughts and the quality of my thoughts. And let's say it in a simple way. Let's say you have a right answer to a real world problem. Does that mean it's the only right answer And does that mean it's the best right answer? You see, now in school, a right answer is all you need. Because if it's right and it added to your score and you got a better grade, that's all you need. But in the real world, there are right answers that are not elegant. They're not the best right answer. They're not the most refined right answer. How about oil as an example? Let's get this icky, gooey, poisonous, residual uh, dinosaur stuff and dead leaves and organic material from millions of years ago, and we'll pump it up out of the earth and we'll burn it. Now, some countries have more of this than others, so that's going to lead to international tension. That's going to lead to war, right? A lot of people are going to die because we're going to get this oil that we're going to burn for energy, And that's going to lead to global warming. And we've got a solution to energy, burn oil, right? But it's obviously, or now it's becoming obvious, that's not the best right answer. There are other right answers. There are better ways. 
And if you always wait for a problem to look for a solution, then you're creating problems, you see. You can look for solutions without having a problem walk up and slap you in the face. Yeah, and that's what failing to succeed really is all about, is taking some risks. It's going out there and trying new stuff. If everything's copacetic, if everything's fine, if there's no quote-unquote problems on the horizon and you don't do anything, you just stay you know, right there, then that's not really success. Success is, is failing forward. It's making mistakes. It's reaching out. It's trying new things. It's expanding. It's growing. It's awakening. It's enlivening. It's, it's just it feels so great to do. And, and again, it means thinking in, in new ways. It means getting out of all of the stuff going on in your head, being either memory or naming the things you see in your environment. You know, that doesn't count. Like, like watching TV or looking at something that, and not thinking about it, not having new thoughts. So, oh, that's pretty is not thinking. You know, saying something you've said before about something is not really what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is trying out, exploring new ideas. Wondering. One, wonder is always thinking, indeed. Wondering and, and being awestruck and having like, wow, I never thought of that before. I never put that together with that before. That, that dawning that, that or that aha experience, that's, that's the kind of thinking I'm talking about. And if, if you take a look at successful people who not only appear successful but consider themselves to be successful, they'll always tell you about these aha kind of experiences they have, this great idea that, that they took off with, this, this passionate thing that they pursued. They'll always tell you about how something just popped into their head and they just like put everything they had into it. That's, that's just so consistent among successful people. When people say, I'm not interested, maybe you just haven't found something interesting in what you think you're not interested in. I mean, again, we're so quick sometimes to judge, to prejudge, and in this case, even ourselves. How do you know you're not interested? Somebody's interested in this topic. Somebody wrote the book. Somebody's an expert. Somebody's got a PhD in this subject, and then some can't get enough of it. Not that we have to be interested in all things, but there is something fascinating in all things if you look at it right. What's that Dylan line or Grateful Dead line about? Oh, once in a while, you get shown the light in the strangest of places if you look at it right. If you look at if it right. If you look at it right. That's the key. I wonder. Okay. Are you in touch with that? It starts really deep for me and as a feeling in my heart. I wonder. You know, there's a great Carl Sagan line. How does he say it? Somewhere, someplace in the universe, something incredible is just about to happen. And that always blew my mind. It's like, wow, that is so cool. And yet that's the passion of the person that loves to learn. Someplace, any minute now, something <laughs> incredible is about to happen, and I want to know about it. Dylan said, things that are about to get interesting right about now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love that feeling. Of something's going to happen. That, because when you're thinking about, like, something's going to happen, you're thinking about, like, what it is. What is it that's going to happen? And that's not something you thought about before. That's doing new kinds of thinking. That's, that's mixing memory with environment and putting them together in new ways. That's juxtaposing things that you've never juxtaposed before. That's what I'm talking about. And I think success always includes a lot of that stuff because if you're just thinking what you thought before, you're going to get what you've been getting before. And to me, success has to have that growth component. And, yeah, we do grow, but... To be able to be in charge of the direction of the growth and the speed of the growth, that's really a, a great deal of what success is all about. All right, let's talk about some of the areas of life where we want to create success with happiness. That's the way. Okay, and by happiness, we mean joy, love, peace, and qualities of understanding that come from joyful, peaceful states of mind. It's not only happiness, yay, I'm thrilled. It's the expanded awareness, the insight, the understanding. How do you lift knowledge to understanding? I'll say it that way. How do we take exposure to information and integrate it into what you already know through happiness? That's what we mean. So you've got to create a desired goal or an outcome. How about looking at different areas of your life where we should do that? One construct I use a lot, Steve, is uh, self, relationships, career, and everything else. Sort of like three concentric circles, starting with success, personal success. What would I like to do in my life? And then the second 
ring out would be relationships, family, uh, that kind of stuff. Kids, do I want kids? And what role will they play in my life? Or do I want my relationship with my husband or wife or partner to evolve in any particular way, to know greater depths of surrender, to consciously work on yielding to relationship in a way, to spirituality in relationship in a way that tends to really dissolve ego and separateness, which is really hard in a relationship, but maybe that's what relationships are for. And then third, a relationship with the world around us, job, needing to have a career, to make some money, okay, to keep your head above water financially, but also find even deeper meaning and purpose. And how do I contribute to my community and leave the world maybe just a little bit better of a place than it was when I, when I came here, when I found it, you know? That would be one way of breaking it down, self, relationships, and career. Yeah, it would. And and the idea of being happy through all of those things. And again, happy is not something that you don't have when you're going through hard stuff. You can be happy going through hard stuff. Happy is feeling good about yourself, even if you're not feeling good about the circumstances or feeling good about the situation. You can still feel good about yourself and your ability to make it through this circumstance or situation. I break it down into five areas, actually. I talk about my relationship, my primary relationship, and my career. I talk about my health and my wealth and, and the other people in my life and the, all the other you know family and friends and all that other kind of stuff. But, but yeah, Define the areas of your life that are important to you and, and pick in each of those areas where you're heading. Again, what's the, what's the destination? And again, the goal is not like you have to get to that destination. You don't. The idea is that's the direction. That's the bullseye. You don't have to hit the bullseye. You just want to aim toward the target. It would be stupid to not aim for the bullseye even if you're probably not going to hit it. The idea is to just have that as your target, as your bullseye, and then start moving that way in all those different areas of your life. Be happy along the way. you know. And to do that, when a a positive thought about that comes up, like I'm accomplishing it or it feels good doing this, say yes to that thought. And when a thought comes up that says, I'm not going to accomplish this or I'm failing at accomplishing this, then say, thank you for sharing. You know, I mean, I'm appreciating that that thought came up and now I get to let go of that thought. And to me, this is so much the key to happiness is that when negative thoughts come up for me, like a negative thought is anything that says it shouldn't be this way. You know, anything that says the is that is shouldn't be the is that is. You know, any of those thoughts that come up that, that it should be different than this kind of thoughts, I get to say, thanks for that coming up. I'm glad I know that I think that. Now, I'm going to release that because I don't believe that. I, I, I have the thought, but that's just because I have the thought doesn't mean I am the thought or I have to believe the thought. I am not the thought. I'm the higher self that can look at the thought and go, mm, nah, I don't think so. A little bit of creative tension is necessary to move the mind forward and the passions as well. And again, if we're of a mind that says this is all a bad thing and that I constantly need to work to resolve any kind of tension, even if it's creative and, and productive and life-affirming, no, 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 I don't want any change. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm back to talking about that. I don't want any problems. I want to be comfortable. I want to get to a place where there's no tension and everything is resolved and fixed forevermore. You know, nothing in nature works that way. Fuller nothing in fantasy even works that way. No, no. <laughs> I, 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 I love Buck, Buckminster Fuller's contributions when he talks about uh, tensile strength and the integrity of the geodesic dome. And there is such a thing as creative tension where opposition makes that which it is opposing even stronger. And, sure. if, and, and so are diamonds made, you know. There's a lot, yeah. The, anytime you have a system in nature, synergy is the word Bucky coined for the whole of a system being greater than the sum of its parts. And that's sort of magical. And it balances entropy in the world. Because many of us have this worldview that everything goes from order to chaos and devolves and runs out of speed and peters out. And Bucky's going, well, that's, that's part of it. But consciousness brings order out of chaos. That's a complementary uh, point of view. Synergy is the idea of doing more with less, becoming much more efficient, you see. You don't have to burn old dinosaurs and palm trees 
in an internal combustion engine to get energy. It's not the only source of energy. Just because we have a solution doesn't mean it's the only solution or the best solution. And that takes us back to where we were taught that idea, that stupid idea in the first place, which was school, which said there's one right answer and every other answer is wrong. And I even remember getting things wrong where I had the right answer, but I did it a different way than they wanted oh, me to that's do so it. Oh, so And yeah. they won't even listen to you yeah, when no, no, you no, try no. to yeah, explain. Exactly. So the bottom line here is that <laughs> failure is inculcated in our hearts and souls as a bad thing from this schooling experience that has to change we can change that. I mean, you know, I never let my education get in the way of my, my schooling get in the way of my education, Twain said. So, so I think that's the key, the, the idea of, yeah, we learn stuff in school, that's okay. But understand, we're not built for school. School's not made based on how the human mind best works. The, the way the human mind best works is to focus mostly on movement and on vision. Because those are the survival things. Thinking is not really much of a survival thing usually. You know, usually it's to be able to move faster, to be able to look around and make sure we're safe. So that's what kids all want to do. They want to move and they want to look at things, you know. And that's why they love their video games where they get to do. So, so school where they're supposed to not move and not really look at anything except the teacher's face, which is probably the least interesting thing in the whole room, that's just not how the mind's built to deal with. So, so school's like backwards and wrong. And, and, and that doesn't mean kids don't need to learn all that good stuff. They do. And there are better ways to do that. And I'm really encouraged by the fact that we have a, a new administration that seems to want to change the education a little bit rather than an old education, uh, an old system, uh, the saying that we're not going to leave any child behind, which means we really left all of our children behind. I always thought every day in school should start with recess. Yeah, I, I don't like mean that. recess, really. I mean like, exercise, like play, run yeah, around, play, run around, get that out, spilt out of your yeah, system. You know, so yeah, absolutely. You can't wait to get to school. I what mean, would they do normally if they woke up and then and at first thing in the day? What would they norm? What would kids uh, a thousand years ago, ten thousand years ago? What would they do before TV? Right, watch my puppy dogs in the morning, and you'll know. <laughs> they get up, they want to have a little something to eat, and then they want to go run and play. You know, that's where I would begin every day. Yep. Uh, Look, you know, the bottom line with so many of our problems in education, and Steve and I harp on this a lot, so I just want to acknowledge it, is money. We just don't give it the proper priority. Let's go just one level deeper. Uh, it's uh, other agencies. I'll let you decide which ones should be having the bake sales, and schools should receive the top priority. The idea of having more than 10 or 12 students in a class or with a given teacher. You could have classes of 35 or 40 students, as we have now, if there were several teachers or teacher aides in there. We could bring in interns. We can bring in parents. We can bring in senior citizens from the community. But to have one teacher for 35 or 40 students, it's way too much. Uh, it, it worked okay in the last century when we were training people for industry to all do the same thing at the same time in the same way, but not anymore. Your kids, in fact, we're already seeing this, people being paid more for the way they think and how they feel than what they're able to do with muscle and brawn. And that's going to continue to move in that direction you're going to have to have some sort of skill or trade, and it'll probably have more to do with how you think and feel than your ability to dig a ditch or, or lug a box or wait on other people. We'll have machines to do a lot of that stuff, robotics. So start thinking, whatever your age and, and level of attainment in life, how can I be successful in a dynamic way by solving problems maybe that most people don't even know they have, or by wondering, by being interested, by being passionate, certainly not by looking for some kind of place of comfort where there are no problems. Say to yourself, I am a problem solver. I am an agent of change. I love to learn. And then I think you'll see how happiness leads to success, and this is a dynamic that never ends. It just keeps unfolding better and better. So when you're looking at success, and again, you have to define it yourself, you have to ask yourself some basic questions. Like, for example, what role does money play? What role does money play in my definition of success for me? And whatever, whatever you determine, you know, that's, again, the bullseye. That's what you want to aim for. Then you have to be moving in that direction to be 
successful. So the way you move in that direction, very simply, is to change your mind about money and just to have one shift of thought. If, if you have a negative idea about money now, if you're one of those you know, negative thinkers about money, one of those uh, people who are always complaining, always late with their bills, always messing up with money, the first thought you usually have when money comes in is, is like, oh, what do I have to spend this on? You know, like, who do I owe money to? If you're one of those normal people that, like, you know, like most people, that are break-even consciousness, you know, then when money comes in, you have a good thought. It goes like, what do I want to spend this on? But if you want to be happy and you want to be successful, all you have to do is change your thinking so that when money comes in, your first thought is how much of this can I save and invest and how much of that can I give away? Because if you do that, you're always going to have more and you're always going to also have this experience of philanthropy, which feels so great. You're always going to have everything you need to move in the direction of being successful. Just change your mind and decide whenever money comes in, how much of this can I save and invest? Maybe only a penny, maybe only $100 or whatever. How much of this can I save and invest? Be reasonable. But if you say nothing, you're lying. You can't and save and invest something of it. How much of this can I save and invest in? How much of that can I give to people that with causes I believe in or who need help more than I do? How, how can I share my compassion and my philanthropy? That also yeah. affirms your prosperity and Absolutely. helps you to, you know, not to interrupt you, but we need to do an audio journey, and I want to make sure we have all five. You said, I, I, said, I talked about three areas of defining success, self, relationships, and career. You said you had five. Would you summarize those? Yeah. Um, basically, I take a look at my my relationship, my primary relationship. They're all about me, of course, but my primary <laughs> you know, you're asking me about my idea of success. My primary relationship, my career, okay, those are the, the two that you talked about as well, and then my health, my prosperity, and then my extended family. My my brother, you, my my friends, you know, my mom, everybody that isn't my primary relationship. That's a, there's a different level. My, uh, Teresa and I are on a different level than I am with anybody else in the whole world. So I I consider that as separate. So it's my work, my love, my health, my prosperity, my safeness. Safeness, I guess, is prosperity in there too. But security, all that stuff, and then my extended family. And that's uh, what I, I think that's very sensible. I like that a lot. Let's yeah, do another. Actually, I got that from Tom Hill. Now that I think about it, really? Yeah. Who, who's Tom? Uh, Hill? Tom Hill, great author uh, and a motivational speaker. Uh, works with me with Vistage. I had a group called the Eagles, the Eagle Group. Uh, cool guy, and, and he had a book that uh, mentioned those uh, five areas. I think I, I think I sort of had those delineated myself, but this was about fifteen years ago. Or so he he put those in a book, and I think that that was the guy that I got that from. Real clear. That's great. Let's do an audio journey, and we'll install this idea. Again, we promote meditation. It would be silly if we didn't include a guided imagery exercise. There's lots of people on the Internet and radio talking and talking and talking, but not too many people on the Internet, and nobody on the radio or TV is going to take you into these expanded levels, the alpha brainwave level. It's easy enough to go there. But most people are resistant to doing it, so we're going to be a helpful aid to you here. That's right. In Hawaii, we say, this is Dakin. Dakin. This is Dakin. Close your eyes and relax. Find a comfortable place. This is why we call this finding yourself in paradise. And paradise is an attitude. It's a level of feeling safe and relaxed. So close your eyes. Feel balanced. Put your shoulders back and raise your head so that you feel an alignment, so to speak, an openness or receptivity. And take a few slow, deep breaths, two or three nice, slow, deliberate breaths, pulling in strength and power as you inhale. Hold for just a moment. And then as you exhale, ah, feel the letting go in your body. And relax. And peace comes over you like a warm silken sheet and helping you feel relaxed. And your body relaxes with every breath you release. And your anxiety abates and all worrying does cease. And your thoughts are of happiness and feeling great as your peaceful place you now create in your mind. 
And as you do, you find that your thinking becomes clear. Confusion is gone. Focus is here. Relaxed, focused, and clear. Imagine yourself on an archery range. And a ways in front of you is the target. And it's got a bullseye on it. It's uh, maybe attached to a big bale of hay, right? A colorful series of concentric circles. And you're going to shoot for the center of that circle, of course. And imagine that you're the archer and you release an arrow for the center of that. But I want you to be the arrow now, all right? Having released it. And you're heading... Isn't the imagination wonderful how easily you can imagine in slow motion and freeze frame being the arrow? And the arrow head is your head. That's what I see in my mind. Your face. Your the face, head. yeah. And so you're going face first toward the center of the target. But because this is an audio journey and we're feeling very safe and relaxed, and our attention is focused, and our imagination is rich. We can imagine, unlike any ordinary arrow, adjusting along the way. In other words, as you get closer and closer, you can see that you're off target. Maybe you're going to be low and to the left, or, or high and to the right. Maybe you'll be a little off target. Maybe you're going to be very off target. So unlike any physical arrow in the real world that you know of, you as the happy journeyer, the adventurer, the one who moves forward happily toward the goal or success, you get to learn from what might look like a failure. You get to learn and find opportunity in missing, apparently, the mark. You get to adjust for, though already fired, it's aim, aim, aim. Ready, aim, fire, aim, aim, readjust, learn, modify. Change your mind as you get closer to that target. And so as that arrow, that self-correcting arrow, that guided missile arrow, you recognize that as the archer, you made a mistake. You shot incorrectly. But you learn from that mistake, and you get to course correct on the way. The only failure would be not shooting the arrow. The opposite of success is doing nothing. Doing something, making a mistake, or being successful, doing something is is always success if you learn from the mistake and you embrace the successes. Not doing anything is the failure. So imagine the archer paralyzed and not shooting the arrow. And see that as failure. But see the archer now shooting you the arrow and as you can course correct, any shot any shot is success. And so in whatever area occurs to you now one of Steve's five basic areas of life imagine whatever pops up into your head attaining a goal creating success It feels like real accomplishment. It's a wonderful feeling. Experience it now. Give no thought as to what it took to get here. Just know that you learned and modified along the way. And if you hadn't begun, you wouldn't even have created those opportunities. To others, they may initially look like failure. But you understand how to learn from your mistakes, how to fail forward failing your way 
to success. Experience that now in one area, and then in another area, and then another area. Disappointed from time to time? Of course. Just don't stop there. Learn from it. Keep moving forward. In matters of consequence, never, ever, ever quit. Just learn and continue to move forward one step at a time. And therefore, failure always leads to success. The only way you can fail to succeed is to not shoot the arrow, is to not play the game, is to let life do its, have it, is to let life have its way with you rather than having your way with your life. And so, having your way with your life by paying attention to your thoughts and feelings, agreeing with the ones that you like, and letting go with a deep breath the ones that you wish to release. That way, every thought makes you happy. Bring yourself to awareness of where you are in time and space. And with a deep breath, bring yourself back to wide awake. I think this is really smart stuff and takes the pressure off, you know. I look to nature, and when I see truth and beauty in nature, it's never perfect, right? In fact, what's really interesting in nature is that which is a little unusual. Its beauty is found in its asymmetry or its irregularity or its exceptional nature. And to have that attitude about yourself and your life, I think, is just so liberating. Don't be like everybody else. You don't want to be successful in the common way or conventional way. Be wildly successful. Learn from your mistakes. Have an adventure. And remember to play the game. Yeah, be happy in your relationships. Be happy in your career. Be happy in your health and your wealth and your family and friends. Be happy and... Happiness leads to success. Remember, success isn't a place you're going to get to. It's not. It's not the bullseye that once you hit, you're there. You know, because that's it. Then there's got to be something after that. Now, ha- happiness leads you to the feeling of being successful along the way by growing in the direction and at the speed you wish to be growing by awakening, by becoming more aware, by becoming more of who you really are, by acknowledging and living as much as you can in the higher self. The part of you that knows you're not your thoughts and your feelings. You are, in fact, the awareness. By the way, I want to thank everybody who participated in our survey a couple of weeks ago that we sent out. And So if for any reason you're not getting that newsletter, just send us an email at info at focusedpassion.com, all right? And we'll get you all signed up. All we really need is your first name and your email address, and if you send me an email... It'll be in it, right? Just info at focusedpassion.com, and we'll make sure you're on the email list, too. Okay? Use the Send One to a Friend gadget at focusedpassion.com, and keep coming back because we have new features on that website all the time. And we'll keep you apprised and let you know what's new at focusedpassion.com. Talk it up, tweet about it, forward it in your email, and mostly use our gadget. It's built in on the website at focusedpassion.com. You can find Michael on Twitter at Focused Passion, and my username is Stephen L. Snyder. So uh, tweet us. It'd be fun. Tweet, 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 tweet. Thanks a lot for listening. Tell your friends about it, and we'll talk to you next week. As always, be gentle, love life, and take care of each other. For Steve Snyder, this is Michael Benner. Aloha from Maui. <laughs>